Well, good morning. Thank you all so much for being here. We are continuing our study through the book of Luke. Today we're going to be making our way through Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. The parable of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus continues, Or what woman... Having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and sweep diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. We are going to do what we do every single week. Before we move forward, we must first back up. And we do that so we can keep everything in its proper context because that is so important when it comes to reading and understanding the word. It's keeping everything in its proper context. Now last week we made our way through Luke 14 verses 25 through 35. And we know that at this point in Jesus' life, He's making his way towards Jerusalem. This, he's in his final months before going to the cross. Now, we're not certain where his exact location is, but we know that he's heading towards Jerusalem. And in this moment, there's a massive crowd surrounding Jesus. That, that happened a lot with Jesus. Crowds would just follow him. And, and I know we, we always hear that, and we just take it for granted but we have to understand there was no one like this man, this God-man, who spoke with an authority like no one has ever done before, who was doing miracles, bringing people back from the dead. So, of course, this God-man was going to attract a crowd even if the majority of the crowd didn't like him. But this moment, this crowd is surrounding him. And he turns to the crowd. And, and this, is, this is another reason why Jesus never wrote a book on how to grow the church. But he says this to the crowd, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Notice there's no hello. He just gets straight to the point. What's he telling that massive crowd? He's saying when it comes to following me, believing that I am the Savior, it's not going to be easy. For many of the Jewish people back then who claimed Christ, their family would disown them. And this is an, another concept that's difficult for us to grasp. We live in the buckle of the Bible belt. Everyone claims Jesus here. Everyone. Now, picture yourself back in the ancient times, growing up with a Jewish family who had been taught throughout the generations that their salvation came by way of their good works and their bloodline. And now you have this man, this God man standing before them saying, no, that's not true. Your salvation comes by way of the Savior. 
Not by any work that you have done, O man, but all the work that I am doing. And now picture yourself being that Jew, going to your family and saying to them, I think we've been doing this wrong. I think everything that we have been taught has been a lie. Your family would go ballistic. How dare you question the authority of the religious leaders? How dare you question our traditions? Who are you saying that you're following this man? The Jewish people had bought into the lies of the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. But Jesus doesn't stop with just saying, you must hate your family. And what does he mean by that word hate? I think we we trip up on that often. What he's saying is, Jesus, you are going to love above everyone else. Everyone else is going to fall second to your love for Christ. But shouldn't it? I mean, should that not be your primary love, the very man who went to the cross if you claim to be a believer, who took your sins? But not only did he take your sins, but he took the wrath of God that you so deserve. Should he not be your first love? That's what Jesus is saying here. But he doesn't stop. In Luke 14, 27, he says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So not only is he saying that you must hate your family, but you must hate yourself. You must be willing to die for him. The symbol of the cross doesn't register with us like it did with the ancient Jewish people. The cross to them was a torture device. The Roman Empire was over and ruled Jerusalem during the time. That was, they were known for torturing people by way of the cross, by killing people on the cross. Nero himself would turn Christians into flaming torches on the cross. Did he take them down afterwards? No. He would leave them up. They would sit there and rot. Birds would feed on those people hanging on the crosses. So yes, the image of the cross meant something more to the people then than it does us today. When he said cross, they knew exactly what he meant. You must be willing to give your life for him. So not only might you be disowned, but you might also lose your life. Jesus didn't tell the massive crowd that if you follow me today, every day is going to be a Friday. If you follow me today, you're going to live your best life now. It almost seems as if Jesus is talking the people out of following him. My, how the church has missed this point. Jesus. (laughs) Jesus talking to this massive crowd of people. Look at Luke 15, verse 1 still standing before them. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. The tax collectors were probably the most hated Jews amongst the Jews. And why is that? Because the Jewish tax collector worked for the Roman Empire and would collect taxes from the Jewish people. But the Romans had an understanding with the Jewish tax collectors. If you take more taxes than what we're asking for, you can keep that. 
All we want is our tax. And that's what the Jewish tax collectors did. They would charge more, keeping what they could. So the Jewish people hated the tax collector. And now here's Jesus mingling with the tax collectors. The Jewish crowd would have just been standing there shaking their head. What is he doing? Does Jesus not know who he's talking to? This man has raised the dead, but he's hanging with the sinners. See, they were shocked by this, that the Jewish person would have been, because the religious elite wouldn't be caught dead around the tax collector or the sinner. But Jesus was. He was allowing the tax collectors to gather around him and also the sinners. Notice the tax collectors have their own category. You have the tax collectors and then you have the sinners. Both hated. And who are the sinners? They were also called the the unrighteous. They were the non-religious Jews. The Pharisees had nothing to do with either party. But there's Jesus surrounded by them. Look at verse 2. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. William Barclay gives us an understanding of how the Pharisees felt towards the tax collectors and the sinners. I was going to try and paraphrase him, but I'm like, no, Britt, you're too much of an idiot to try and make it sound intelligent. So I'm just going to read you what William Barclay said. The Pharisees gave to people who did not keep the law a general classification. They called them the people of the land. And there was a complete barrier between the Pharisees and the people of the land. The Pharisaic regulations laid it down. When a man is one of the people of the land, entrust no money to him, take no testimony from him, trust him with no secret, do not appoint him guardian of an orphan, do not make him the custodian of charitable funds, do not accompany him on a journey. Could you imagine if I tried to paraphrase that? A Pharisee was forbidden to be the guest of any such man or to have him as a guest. They could not be associated with those people. He was even forbidden, so far as it was possible, to have any business dealings with him. It was the deliberate Pharisaic aim to avoid every contact with the people who did not observe the petty details of the law. The strict Jews said not, there will be joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, but there will be joy in heaven over one sinner who is obliterated before God. That's how the Pharisees felt towards these people. And where are these people? Surrounding Jesus. So once again, we see Jesus going against the false teaching of the Pharisees. That false teaching that the religious were to have nothing to do with the sinner. Jesus was associating with the ones The Pharisees wouldn't. Did he do it to mess with them? Was he just poking at the Pharisees? No. He was there to share the gospel to those who would hear. He was there to save those who were lost. See, the Pharisees preached salvation came by following the laws instead of following the Savior. The Pharisees taught that salvation came by their own works instead of having faith in the works of the Savior. 
But church, we know that man cannot please God apart from Christ. So God found no pleasure in man trying to follow his laws without following Christ. God does find pleasure when a sinner believes in his only begotten son and repents. God rejoices in the lost being found. Whereas the Pharisees, who were the so-called teachers of God's word, were nothing more than foolish, money-grubbing hypocrites. They weren't interested in pointing the lost to Christ. They weren't interested in the lost repenting of their sins. No. They were too busy teaching a false gospel based on one's works and bloodline. For if the Pharisees truly understood and believed God's word, they too would have been around the sinners and pointing them to the Messiah who had always been promised to save the wicked, the rebellious, the wretched, the sinner. Now, let me say this real quick. So often, believers will go and hang out in places they shouldn't be hanging out. And what is their excuse? Well, Jesus hung out with the sinners and Pharisees. Yes, O man, but when you go to that place where you shouldn't be, are you preaching the gospel or are you indulging? That's the difference. Yes, Jesus went to those places, but Jesus was going after the lost. Now, you too can go to those places if that's what you are doing because that's what you have been called to do. But don't give the excuse, well, that's what Jesus did, unless you're willing to follow in his footsteps. All right, continuing. Look at verse 3. Picture this scenario. And guys, I'm sorry, if I, if I lift up my hands and you see stain on it, it's just because I'm sweating and I'm taking the stain off the pulpit. <clears throat> so here's the thing. Remember this scenario, a massive crowd, the Pharisees standing there, grumbling at who Jesus is hanging out with. Now notice it doesn't say that Jesus heard them. It's Jesus. He knows all that's going on. He knows exactly what's taking place. So Jesus goes into this parable for the Pharisees. Verse 3, so... He told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Now the Pharisees would have automatically assumed that they were to put themselves in the place of the shepherd. They would have been insulted by that. Why? Why? Because the shepherd was considered low class. The shepherd would have to work seven days a week. And if they did not keep the Sabbath day, they were not allowed to worship. So for the Pharisees to look at this parable and put themselves in the place of the shepherd, they would be appalled. They're sitting there thinking, how can I consider myself to be ceremonially unclean? Because that's what the shepherd was, working seven days a week. Ceremonially unclean. So just from the beginning of this parable, by using the shepherd, Jesus had already threw the Pharisees a curveball. And what was he doing? In that little moment, he was exposing the Pharisees' pride because they thought they were better than everyone else. 
Let's jump into this parable. Now, during this time, if you have 100 sheep, more than likely a village pulled all their sheep together. And more than likely, during this time, even though we are speaking of a parable, but this kind of helps us understand it a little bit better, the village would hire three shepherds to oversee the hundred sheep. One of those sheep wanders off. So now you're down to 99. Well, the shepherd responsible for that sheep would recognize, he would notice that one is missing. So he probably counts three or four different times. And he's like, yeah, for sure. I'm missing a sheep. I've got to go find him. He would tell the other two shepherd, shepherds, you guys stay right here. Watch these sheep. I've got to go find the one that has wandered away. And he had to do it quickly. Because the sheep, they weren't fighters. I mean, they would bite, yes. But they couldn't protect themselves from the predators. So again, the shepherd had to act quickly. I don't know if you guys have ever done this. You're trying to leave the house in the morning, and you don't know where you put your car keys. And you've gone through the house like five or six times. And then there's that magic moment where you see them. And it's like this, ah, you know. You can almost picture the shepherd when he sees that sheep. He's like, oh, there's that, there he is. Okay, so he, he goes after it. He grabs it. In verse 5 it says, when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. So of course this huge sigh of relief would come out from the shepherd. He would take this sheep, place it up on its shoulder, and he would carry it back home. Now a full grown sheep can weigh up to 100 pounds. So this trek home wasn't going to be an easy one. And we picture ourselves today. The average height of a man is what, 5'9", 5'10"? Goes anywhere from 170, 185 pounds. People were a little bit smaller then. So you think about this 100-pound sheep on this smaller man, this shepherd, who had been a working man. He had been a tough man. But here he is, carrying this sheep home. And look at verse 6. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. So often when I heard this parable, I would automatically, I just assumed that he took the sheep back to the pasture with the rest of his sheep buddies. But, but reading this, it, it, it appears that he carries this sheep to his home. He doesn't take it back to the pasture. Not only does he take it home, but when he arrives, he goes knocking on his friend's doors. Man, we've got to have a party. I found my sheep. It got away, wandered off. But I've rescued it. Now the Pharisees, in the beginning, may have first believed the parable was about the shepherd doing the responsible thing, going after that sheep. And of course, that would warrant a celebration. They were thinking it would warrant a celebration. Why? Because the sheep is worth money. The sheep are valuable. So the Pharisees would have definitely reacted to that, for they themselves were lovers of money. But it's here. Jesus tells them the moral of this parable. Look at verse 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. For the Pharisees to not understand the parable demonstrates just how blind they were to the word. Of God. Those whose profession was to teach the Word of God and yet they didn't understand what this parable was talking about? That God had sent His Son to rescue the lost? 
And since they couldn't grasp the parable, they also didn't grasp every time the lost came to faith, when they believed, when they repented, that God and all those in the heavenly realm rejoiced. The Pharisees were more concerned with people's obedience to their man-made laws than the sinners who were perishing all around them. The Pharisees weren't the shepherd. The Pharisees were the 99 sheep, also known as the so-called righteous persons. Why is that? Because the Pharisees believed they were righteous in and of themselves. They had no reason to repent, nor to look for the Savior who had been promised. Now we know the good shepherd is Christ, who went after that one, that being fallen man. And just as the shepherd scooped down and picked up that wandering sheep and carried him home, so went Christ to the cross. And while hanging on that cross, carried the full burden of the believer's sins upon himself, while also enduring God's wrath on their behalf. Now if we could just picture this crowd again, more importantly, picture the faces of the Pharisees in that crowd. Confusion, anger would have been written all over their faces. But Jesus doesn't stop. He goes into a another parable. Look at verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? So the first character, the shepherd, would have offended the Pharisees. Now this second character, being a woman, would have really offended the Pharisees. The Pharisees considered women to be second class. So notice in both parables, Jesus is using a character that the Pharisees despise. So now Jesus using a poor woman would have really got the Pharisees' attention. Now this one coin that she had lost was worth a day's work. So for a woman who is poor, losing a day's wage was significant. To be honest with you, losing a day's wage to me is pretty significant too. I'd be looking for it as well. Now we're not told how she lost it, but what we do know is during this ancient time, What some women would do would take their money, string the coins together, and wear it around their neck. So it very well could have been the cord broke, coins hit the ground, one rolls away. Again, we're not sure how she lost the coin, but she begins tearing the house apart looking for it. She even pulls out the lamp. Why? Because during that time, you didn't really have windows in the house, so it would have been dark. So she's got the lamp. She's moving couches out of the way. She's looking under the refrigerator. They didn't have refrigerators, but she's got the lamp, and she's searching. She pulls out the broom and starts sweeping. This thing has got to be around here somewhere. And then that glorious moment. Look at verse 9. And when she has found it, She calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Again, she grabs the coin, has them all together, starts pounding on her neighbor's doors. Let's have a party. 
I lost this coin, but I found it. We're going to celebrate. So they would party over this coin being found. So once again, the Pharisees would be left shaking their heads. Yeah, she lost a coin. We agree with that. We too would have looked for it because we're, we love money. Now, there's something else that Jesus has done in both of these parables. He keeps the Pharisees' attention. In both of these, by way of money being an issue. The woman, of course, the coin. But with the sheep, that was extremely valuable during that time. So he's continuously exposing their pride throughout. Now look at verse 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now this would have been like a load of bricks being poured out upon those Pharisees. Just pounding them in the head. Because now they're sitting here thinking, wait, it's not a, that parable wasn't about a, a sheep getting lost? The other parable wasn't about the woman finding a coin? There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner he who repents. Jesus knew the Pharisees had missed the point. This isn't about celebrating finding money. No, this is about you, O oh Pharisees, neglecting the lost, while God rejoices in the lost being found. Here they were. Grumbling amongst themselves, that being the Pharisees, over Jesus doing what God rejoices in. Speaking, teaching, preaching the good news to the sinner. God's joy radiates through the heavens every time a sinner believes and repents. His joy is so great that all the angels and the saints share in it. Imagine that. Now, I don't know if you're one of the saints who can recall the day in which you were saved, but if you can, picture the celebration that was taking place in heaven while you, O oh sinner, was being rescued. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you claim to be the religious authority and yet you don't understand the word. Or else you wouldn't be judging me for being with the tax collectors and the sinners. If you truly understood the word as you claim to, you too would be with the tax collectors and the sinners. This parable is straightforward. The woman is Christ searching for the lost sinner in the dark, dusty, hidden places of this fallen world. But there is something that we cannot overlook in these two parables. At any point in time, was the sheep looking for the shepherd? No. The sheep did not care about the shepherd. The sheep was wandering in the opposite direction. At any point in time in the second parable was the inanimate object, the coin, looking for the woman. No! It was the woman searching for that coin desperately. What does that tell us about our Savior? It is He who rescues us. The ones who are wandering in the opposite direction. The ones who aren't looking for Him because that's who we are in our fallen state. Wanderers, rebellious, not looking for the Savior. But it's the Savior who comes looking for us, God's elect, God's chosen. And when that Savior comes looking, that Savior gets exactly who He is looking 
four. And that's what Christ did for the lost. He came and lived a perfect life in this fallen world of sinners. And what he did he what did he do for those sinners? What did he do for the ones who would believe in him? For those sinners, Christ went to the cross and bore God's wrath for those sins. He died for those sins. But church, the Savior who rescued you, the grave could not hold him. For thee, Savior, rose, defeating death once and for all, for the lost that he was sent to rescue.